Welcome to Mindset Your Business, a space all about self-connection, self-reconnection, and self-acceptance for the millennial women striving for authenticity and deeper relationships. I'm your host, Dr. Lanisha, a millennial woman affectionately known as the Connect Her. I am a wife, mother, daughter, friend, mental health therapist, coach, and speaker. But most importantly, I am her. Healing, evolving, and remarkable. One of my superpowers is helping women find their way to themselves or back to themselves. There is so much in this world we have to focus on, and we often fall short with focusing on ourselves. Now look, y'all, we're about to take the conversations out of the group chat and have the discussions publicly. Consider this your public group chat. You can expect our conversations to go deep, be transparent, and honest, but sprinkled with some humor and a whole lot of love. So whether you're the millennial woman who is the parentpreneur, the career climber, the creative, the advocate for mental health, the academic, the digital nomad, the influencer, the policymaker, or someone who is searching for deeper meaning in themselves, you're in the right place. So why the name Mindset Your Business? Simple. You are your number one business. How you maneuver through this life and on this journey of connection and iconic impact is all about what you believe. So come on in, get real comfortable as we mindset our business. I am joined by a very, very special guest today. We are talking about integrity and business success. I am joined by Janice Wiggins, founder and CEO of Grant Me Success. She is also my Sarah, my line sister, the ace of our line. Shout out to Flight 37, Spring 18, and my Sarah of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Welcome to the pod, sis. Thank you so much, my sister, Dr. Lanisha. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate this. And I know we've been planning this for a while. I've been watching you. You've been watching me. And we've been kind of like doing this dance. But I'm so excited for us to just kind of dialogue and share what we've been doing for the past couple of years. You know, this show is dedicated to Black women entrepreneurs. And you have been in this thing called entrepreneurship for a while. So it was only right. For me to bring you on the show. And I'm so grateful that you accepted the invitation. So we are going to go ahead and get started and get into the conversation today. So I'm very big on celebrating wins. Super huge on that. You know, we we spend a lot of time talking about what's not going well, what's going wrong. You know, what we don't have, what we wish we had. But I want to talk about wins. There's no other way to start off the show other than asking you to share your recent, any recent wins. Thank you so much for having me on Mindset Your Business podcast. I feel like first and foremost, this is a win. Okay, this is a win right here, right now. Since you're talking about celebrating successes celebrating wins. I'm celebrating you today. Oh, right. how about that? That's a celebration. You. Okay. Thank you. Can you know how the crab baby to Fetty right now. I'm throwing confetti right now. That's definitely a win for me because like I said, we know each other. We're sisters and, but we don't always get an opportunity to just stop and talk and say, hey, what you got going on? What do you have going on? We see each other on social media. We see each other in person, right, at different events. We have an opportunity to celebrate with one another. We recently attended a wedding together in ATL, celebrating one of our lovely line sisters. So it's always great to be able to see you in person as well. But we don't always get a chance to just stop and say, hey, tell me really how has business been? And what do you have going on? How can I help you? How can I assist? Let me tell you what I have going on. I don't know, maybe this can help you. Here's this resource, that resource. So I consider this a win because it's allowing us to connect in a different way. 
right? To have those conversations about how we can support one another in our businesses. So I'll catch you up on some wins that I had like in 2023 and then how that's carrying forward now into 2024. In 2023, I was introduced to two different programs that I just felt that it was right for me to to get involved in. One was a Downtown Vegas Alliance Business Incubator. Man, I had heard about business incubators. I just felt like I never really had the time to fully get engaged and involved in one because many of them are like eight weeks or 12 weeks. I think about like the commitment and I want to make sure that whatever I sign up for as a businesswoman, as a business professional, that I show up for them. Even though it was like a free program, I still don't want to take things for granted. Right. I want people to know that I appreciate the programs that they're offering to other small businesses. So I want to make sure if I register, if I sign up, that I'm committed to attend. For those of us who may be wondering, what is a small business incubator? So my understanding is that they are programs that are, it's usually like a series for several weeks or several months that helps to provide a small business owner with information about capacity building, right? And just growing their business. So perhaps they have sessions with talking about how to make sure you have your corporate structure set up right. You know, some people like me, I started out as a solo entrepreneur. I didn't really have a business license for quite some time, right? I didn't even know how to go about getting a business license. I didn't know how to get an EIN number. That's an employer identification number from the IRS. I didn't know how to register with the Secretary of State. I didn't know any of this information. And quite frankly, I really didn't even know who to ask. But business incubators may be those type of programs that can help to walk a business owner through those beginning steps and stages for a startup. And then for those companies that are already existing, it's a way to help them to continue to grow mm-hmm. and level up, so to speak, helping them with learning about marketing. How do you market your business? Are you marketing it properly? Social media is a very big thing. I remember back when I was initially learning about business. I hadn't started a business, but this was probably back in 2007, 2008. And I started attending some networking group. This is when Facebook, let's see, maybe we were still on MySpace. People may not have even been on Facebook. (laughs) But I remember going to a women's, all women's networking group. Mm -hmm. And I remember a woman saying out loud to the entire group that she will never get on social media. Mm -hmm. It was a taboo thing for her. I think because back then in 05, 06, 07, we really didn't know yet how social media was going to play such a huge role in business and in our society in general. Yeah. And I wonder, and I think back to that woman now, and I have to think if I can remember the name of her company, I wonder if she's still in business. Because I'm like, girlfriend, if you haven't gotten on social media... Yep. Where are you getting your customer? Where right. are you getting client? Well, you know, yep. I'm kind of concerned. Social media is definitely a lead generating source. Yeah, it's the only thing, but I really am kind of wondering, like, has her mindset, right? Because we're talking about mindset. But we show Has her mindset or did her mindset ever evolve and change about how to market her business? And did social media become part of that strategy? That's what business incubators do. They help with, let's say, accounting, bookkeeping, Mm -hmm. sharing with business owners. How do you have your paperwork in place, right? And that everything is legitimate so that you can go to the next level. Maybe human resources, capacity building. How do you hire and bring on your first employee? Mm -hmm. How do you bring on contractors with 1099? What's the difference between employees and 1099 contractors? So that's what business incubators do. They bring in experts who have a wealth of knowledge. Either they have been business owners before, they've led Fortune 500 companies, and they just share information and resources. 
So I had the opportunity. One came across my email for the Downtown Vegas Alliance. And I said, okay, yeah, I got 12 weeks. I'm going to commit. I'm going to go. So I attended that one. And there was so many people who were involved and engaged. I got connected with the Urban Chamber of Commerce. I got connected with so many other people in the community. And someone in the group, or maybe it was another one of my clients, also who knew I was going through that program and knew that I was ready to expand my business, she shared with me about a state grant program that assisted small business owners with offering them grant funding to hire a full-time employee. So through that program in 2023, I was able to hire my first full-time employee So that was a huge win. And then I brought on some contracted grant writers as well in 2023. And what that helped me to do is it was a launching pad for what's happening now in 2024, which is I now have the capacity to bring on more clients, service more customers, improve my customer service and response times, I was able to secure another grant through a program called Envy Grow. And that program is actually a program that helped other small businesses, but I was able to work with them to implement a small business grant academy. Initially started in April, we had 13 small businesses go through the academy. In May, we had like seven more businesses going through the academy. And then in June, which our our June Academy starts tomorrow, we have nine small businesses registered for that. Oh. So I think that was a long time explaining some wins, but those yeah. are the recent, recent wins. That is okay. I appreciate that. We needed to hear that story for sure, for sure. Because you could have said, like, I started, I connected with a group, started the Small Business Academy, but... You told us about small business incubators. So I encourage everyone that's listening, wherever you are, see if there is a small business incubator around you and go participate in the resources that they have. We just learned about so many resources that could be available to you as a small business owner. So go ahead and get out there and check them out. Go see. I am charging you with doing that, and I am going to do that as well in my new area. Their wealth of knowledge, and they just connect you with so many, you know, different people. I'm sure like all major cities probably have some type of business incubator. Connect with your chamber of commerce, Mm -hmm. um, your small business development centers, and see what they have going on. Yes, do that, do that. And congratulations on all that you are doing. I so love that. Can't wait for our collab so I can get to talking to these small business owners as well about, you know, making those meaningful connections, which is what most of my work has been centered around here recently. How to build those meaningful connections to elevate your relationships personally and professionally and definitely for sure business relationships. Yes. So you're a social entrepreneur. Tell us what that is, and let's hear about your journey. Yeah, so I I don't know where I picked up on this term, but I picked up on the term. My background is actually in social work. I'm a social worker by education. Mm-hmm. I have a bachelor's in social work and then um, a master's in public administration. So I've always been into health and human services, giving back to community, all of that good stuff. The entrepreneurship part comes in, I want to say maybe around 2004, 5, 6, someone in my family introduced me to entrepreneurship and actually direct sales. And I never really thought of myself as, you know, an entrepreneur wanting to sell stuff. That wasn't my jam, you know, at least I thought. But I got involved in this company, started selling products and things like that. And then I was like, okay, this is a good way to make some extra income in addition to my Monday through Friday, nine to five. As a social worker, 
I have always worked in either nonprofit organizations or I've worked for government agencies, some small businesses, for-profit entities that deal in health and human service, like mental and behavioral health or substance abuse treatment type of programs as a social worker and case manager. But the common theme that I had had through all of my jobs is grant. Either my position was funded by a grant or our agency or company was funded by a grant. And I had to either help write the grant, help collect data for the grant. That was just a common theme, regardless of where I went to go and work. And then later on in my career, someone suggested to me, she was really like a mentor, she suggested that I become a federal grant reviewer. And I was like, oh, I had never heard of such a thing. I was like, okay, you mean I could go and work with the federal government and review grants and learn about grants and get paid for it? Signed up, started reviewing grants for a whole bunch of different agencies. Did that for about 20 years. And then I went to a workshop at UNLV. That's my alma mater. And what they shared during that workshop is that the state that I was living in at the time that I still live in, in Nevada, was like number 48 in the country in receiving federal grants. And I was like, wow, I found that that was like a staggering statistic, considering that we're like near California, Arizona. I was like, okay, well, what's their stats? How many grants are are those states getting? You know, did some research. I just kind of was like, well, wow, I've been a federal grant reviewer all this time. My state is not bringing in a lot of federal grants. What could I possibly do to help to change this? So around 2017, is where I got the idea that I was going to start teaching grant writing workshop. I went to my church and was like, hey, can I start offering some grant writing workshops here? And they were like, yep, you could do it here for free. I started inviting people just to come out using social media, right? I didn't even know who I was going to invite. I didn't know if people cared about grants. I didn't know if people wanted to learn about grants. But at my first workshop, I had 25 attendees. And I was like, okay. I'm on to something. Mm -hmm. And so I started researching how to start a business. And I was like, you know what? I'm a social worker. I want to, I'm dipping my toe into entrepreneurship. I guess I'm a social entrepreneur. So that, that term just kind of stuck with me. I would like that. Mm -hmm. Bring it together. Listen, that is creative. And definitely innovative, too. It was like, well, what can I do? How can I make a difference? You know, filling in that gap. And I coined the term. But once I heard the term, I was like, yeah, I think that kind of defines what I do. I mean, you had never heard it before. So, I mean, (laughs) you you put it together for you. It worked for you. Now, I'm going to be messy for a minute. You know, look, no. Yeah. What direct sales job did you have, boo? Girl, see, I was trying to get past that. And that's why I didn't even say the company. And you have to know you, Petty Betty, Petty Betty's be paying attention. You already know. We spent every single day for a number of months together. You hey, you never know. heard about the direct sense. You don't have to say it if you're a not, I'm not embarrassed of the company. I'm not, I will definitely share with people. I'm not embarrassed of the company. I learned so much mm-hmm. from being engaged in a part of that company. If that company was not in existence, I may not be sitting here today saying that I'm a social entrepreneur. I always, I think, consider myself an extrovert, mm-hmm. but it gave me the ability to use my own natural talents, skills, and abilities and develop them to benefit me financially, right? So the company was the wonderful Mary Kay. And look, the reason why I kind of am bashful about it is because I don't wear no makeup. I was not wearing any makeup. And I was like 20, maybe I was like 27, 28. Mm-hmm. I did not wear any makeup. I didn't know how to pick a foundation color. I barely wore lipstick. I didn't know anything about maybe some mascara. I was scared to put on eyeshadow. You know, skincare, I have acne, always have had very poor acne. And what drew me to the company actually was not really the makeup. It was the skincare. And so I began to use the skincare products. They worked out pretty well for me. And so, yeah, that was the direct sales company. I probably did Mary Kay for about two to three years. 
And it was really just a learning launching pad for me and actually gave me the confidence to go on and participate in two other direct sale companies. And one of them, I really did well in one of those direct sale companies during the recession. So before we had a pandemic, y'all remember we had a recession back in 08, 09, right? No, do I remember. I, I know y'all, some of y'all was feeling it because I know I felt it. Mm-hmm. I was actually laid off from my job, my county job as a social worker where I was very comfortable and accruing time in PERS, which you guys may know is like a retirement program, public employee retirement system. And I was so comfortable in my job. And then this thing called a recession hit, and it was like, okay, you're laid off. And I'm like, what? Laid off? What? Okay, so like go file unemployment. Like, right. look, you ain't got to go home, but you ain't got to come back here either. And, <laughs> yes, yes, right. And then I started looking at, a, at that unemployment check, and I was like, this ain't going to get it. This is not going to pay a mortgage and a car note and some insurance and some groceries. Listen. I understand. I just wanted to know because direct sales taught so many people different skills. And I think a lot of, not I think, a lot of those skills you were able to bring into you as you started to take on the identity of being a social entrepreneur. I was listening to Donnie Wiggins was saying that she is the host of the Full Transparency Podcast. She's also the co-host of Social Proof Podcast. In her interview or in her episode with Dr. Tracy Lynn, she mentioned that she started off in direct sales and direct sales equips her with so many skills, the knowledge base, the expertise that she brings into her business right now. I I have admired Dr. Tracy Lynn from afar as well. Her jewelry line, honey, just fabulous. I love a lot of the piece. Yeah, so that's interesting that you bring up as you might go ahead over to head over to the full transparency podcast and listen to the episode. I, I guarantee you, you will leave or you'll finish that episode feeling so inspired. You know, the fire will be lit under you, ignited in you. Oh my goodness. It it was such a great episode. Took note, full transparency podcast. <laughs> Yeah, so let's talk about foundational integrity. So with over two decades of experience, how do you ensure that core values or the core value of integrity are embedded into the the foundation of the the programs that you help to develop? I would have to start with understanding where my own in- integrity foundation came from, right? And I would say, first and foremost, from my spiritual background and just learning biblical principles about integrity. And then also my background in social work. Talk about ethics and we have ethics training and we have to go through continuing education courses and we learn about confidentiality. We learn about like a client's right to self-determination. We learn about boundaries. We learn about, you know, so many different concepts that um, are interwoven into integrity and living, I think, just not a life of integrity, but then now thinking about a business, building a business with integrity and having integrity at w- as one of those core values. So I think that that's like the foundation that I have just as a person, as a human being. And then bringing those over into my business, making sure that whatever it is that I promise for my clients, whatever I guarantee for clients, whatever I promote, I market, that what I try to communicate about the products or services that I offer, that I try to communicate that with truthfulness, honesty. I try not to overpromise things, but then over deliver. So that's what I would say are, are some of the foundations. And then making sure that when I had the opportunity to bring on staff, employees and or contractors, making sure that I communicate that with them as well, because now they represent Grant Me Success, mm-hmm. right? And they're a mouthpiece for Grant Me Success. And so making sure that we have some common values around integrity. 
that's that's so dope. Integrity, you know, as a core value. When do you think you started to lean into integrity being a core value for you? And I ask that question because some of us are now in our businesses thinking about what our core values are, revisiting them. Because, you know, we we talk about core values in our trainings. We talk about core values maybe on jobs and things like that. But for some of us, you know, we heard it, but we didn't really lean into it. So yep. when did you start to lean into integrity as a core value for you? So like I said, I feel like that that was a... A foundation that was set more in my spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. So I would say probably more as I became a young adult and transitioning into being like a middle-aged adult, right? Like in that late 20s to Mm -hmm. Mm mid-30s time frame, understanding on a professional level what ethics were and all that kind of stuff. But then now really understanding and embracing and understanding what integrity meant to me personally at the core of me being a human being and wanting to be an upright, upstanding human being, right? Treating others how I would want to be treated, wanting to be an optimistic person. So probably reading in my late 20s to mid-30s, reading my Bible, reading self-development book. There's one particular book that I read from a pastor, Frederick Casey Price, Sr. He is now past, but he's the founder of Crenshaw Christian Center, which is kind of like a big mega church in Los Angeles, in California. I grew up in that church. I remember him promoting a lot of books, you know, and you you go on to youth church, you go on to church as a teenager, but now I'm a young adult. And I have to know what this spiritual journey means to me. What does this God thing mean to me? What does being a follower of Jesus Christ mean to me personally? Not my parents, not my grandmama, but what does it mean to me? And so I began to purchase certain books. And somehow or another, I got one a hold of one of his books called Integrity. And so then I began to read that book. And I actually still have that book. I don't know where it is right now. And I recently pulled it out, actually, and gave it as a reading assignment last summer to my kids, to my adult kids who Mm -hmm. are 18 at the time. They were 18, 25, and probably 24 and 26. And it's important to me. It's like you raise your kids and you just you try to parent them, right? You, You parent them. And I say try because we all just kind of trying stuff alone, right? What's going to work? And you're wanting to tell them how important it is to be honest, to have integrity, to have morals, to appreciate this and that and how to conduct yourself, right? How to move in this world that hopefully will be beneficial for them. And if negative things do happen, either you quick to rebound if it's on you right? If it was your mistake, your error, you're, you're quick to apologize or say, you know what? That was really my bad. Uh, you know, it was my fault. I did something wrong. I take that responsibility. Or even if it wasn't you, you might just have to take one for the team or bring things and know how to appropriately bring things to people's attention if you feel like they have done you wrong. So I gave that book and I, I found it and I was looking through and I'm a writer. I like to make a lot of notes. And I had just wrote all in that book. And in the back of the book, there was like some extra blank pages. I don't think they was meant for notes, but it had (laughs) all my notes in there. And I was like, wow, I got to go back and reread this book because now I'm in my late 40s. And I'm like, I want to see what I was thinking. What was I thinking about integrity when I was in my late 20s and my mid 30s? And I'll tell you probably what really prompted is that I was in the midst of, I was in my first marriage Mm -hmm. and I was dealing with being a wife, being a mother, thinking that I was doing all the things right, but my marriage was falling apart. I was 
in the midst of probably getting ready to get a divorce. And eventually we did divorce, but I think I was on this search to try and reckon with the fact that I thought I was doing all the right thing, right? I was a woman of God. I was going to church. I was going to school, getting this education. I was an academic. I had a full-time job. I was a volunteer with my church, sitting on the board, teaching the children's church, right? And then it was like, whammo. And, and I'm like, but why is this happening to me? And so I wanted to learn about what are the things that are going to help me to transition and get through this personal life crisis, you know, and journey. And so that's where really my, I would say my own self-integrity journey began. And then just understanding that you got to take those. I don't know that we can separate. I think some people do try to separate who they are as an individual Mm -hmm. from who they are as a business person. And I just don't know how people can try to compartmentalize and do that. I try to look, and and not trying to say this from a judgmental standpoint, but if I'm going to do business with people, I want to see kind of like what you got going on on your personal side, because how you, I believe, somewhat, in some way, form of fashion, how you conduct yourself in your personal life, maybe how you conduct yourself in business. And I want to have an indication of how you're going to treat me if we develop a business relationship. I I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Love everything that you just mentioned. And that is definitely a great book and the resource that I I think the listeners would appreciate. So if you can send that over to me, I'm with you in my belief that who you are personally, not not every aspect of you, but, but the core of who you are, how you show up, what you value, sometimes or most times dictate what tra- what core values transfers over into how you do business. Some of us start off as solopreneurs. And so we are the business. We are the brand. And so who are we? How do we show up? What does it what would it look like to do business with with us? Like you mentioned, that's definitely an indicator. I agree with you on that one. Earlier you mentioned ethics and you know taking the ethics courses. I want to talk about some ethical decision making and ask you to share with us a situation where you had to make a tough decision that tested your commitment to business integrity. And and also, like, what were some of the lessons that you learned from that? I'll talk about it like ethics in general, but then I'll give a specific example. I don't know about other people, but for me, I have learned a lesson many a times about having contracts. Having contracts and paperwork in place or some type of documentation in place when conducting business because it helps to avoid problems down the road. Because people will have one understanding of something, you may have a different understanding of something and then when it when it comes down to money then things can get funny so that is one thing that i have learned i will say is is probably the the most important thing for me is to have things in writing signed invoice right it's going to be an electronic invoice I am now also learning about the value of subscription Mm -hmm. services, meaning like we're going to have your information on file and it's just going to be automatically deducted because I have in the past six years of being a social entrepreneur, you try to help folks, right? Like my background is social work. I'm supposed to be the understanding, you know, I'm going to work with you, meet you where you are, right? There's all these concepts that we learn, right? Look, I know as a therapist, you have learned all these concepts well, right? For whatever reason, when we try to trans, 
translate those into business and use those concepts, they always don't work out as well from theory to practice. I will say that, and you know, that concept is probably the most important. Look, there's something that I know, you know, in, in therapy that you guys probably operate by. We operate by it in social work, which is if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. If it's not right. documented, it didn't happen, y'all. It Could didn't it, happen. Because everybody's memory is, is not always the same and in alignment with yours. That's probably the one of the most important lessons that I've learned when it comes to, like, really dealing with integrity in my business and making sure that I can always come out on top of an understanding of a situation. And even if it doesn't go my way, I still come out in, on top with preserving my integrity. Even if I owe you, even if I have to discount a service, even if I have to refund a service, even if I have to whatever, whatever it is, if I have to take a loss, I still can feel good about it. And I can still leave the client or my customer feeling good about it because we've resolved a situation based on a written understanding. It sounds like you got a good example of juicy ones. I would I, Yeah, it is. And I'm I a tell an example, you. but I think I want to hear yours first. So listen, my first encounter with understanding that I need to have contracts was back in the day. So you know me and you know that I enjoy makeup. So much so that I used to do makeup for my friends, family members, and things like that. So this lady that was the parent of one of my son's classmates, she was getting married. And she wanted me to do her makeup. Now, this was back when it, she was in, she lived in Illinois, and I had recently moved to Nevada. Well, I, I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'll do your makeup. Now, we texting back and forth. I was like, if you want me to come, you're going to have to pay for my flight to come out there. I don't mind doing your makeup. What, what she wanted was well within my wheelhouse. Everything was perfect. Now, my son would, would go there. He, he goes to Chicago for the summers. I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead. I'll buy my son's ticket to come back because it was my time to pay for the tickets. We swap off, me and his yep. family. And kudos to dad on that on swapping. I just want to say that, you know, cause we don't be giving the dads you no know, shout outs and kudos off the time. Kudos to dad for swapping. And shout out to him. So she was like, okay, I'll get your ticket. She started like giving me, sending me flies, asking me which one would be the best. And at this point, you know, we were still just via text. So it's getting close. I'm like, what's going on with the flights? Mm -hmm. And she was just like, oh, I'm still looking over them, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, they have some really reasonable prices right now. I will go ahead and buy my own flight ticket home. And then you just go ahead and wait for your uh, way to get me. Oh, me. Oh, oh, reverse. Just okay. The, I just connected it to the invoice, the price of my service. And this is the day it needs to be paid back. Because now mama ain't raised no fool. But I did get with a deadline. Getting up close to the deadline, I'm just reminding her, reminding her, reminding her. I stopped hearing from her. Didn't she did respond, didn't text, no call. I would call, no answer, none of that. So I was just like, excuse me. Now it was okay. It it was it definitely ended up being okay because I flew back to get my son, which I appreciated because, you know, I was a little nervous about him flying anyway. But but it ended up working out. More of the story is getting it writing. Get it in writing, have those contracts, do the invoices. You have two resources between myself and Janice that will help you with at least point you in the right direction of how to write an invoice, how to write contracts, you know, where you can find them. I mean, there's so many templates out here these days. Definitely get things in writing, but that was all. Yes. 
I had to tell that story because you stirred you up something. Start talking stirred about you know, I stirred up. That's what it's meant to do. Look, when you get experienced business women together, you should be stirring up some good stuff because yeah. you're seasoned. So you you've been through a couple of things. I had a recent situation with a young woman who's a fellow entrepreneur. I've utilized her services uh, once. And I was very pleased at the initial service. So I said, okay, let me give a second chance. And this happened to be an event and thought it was understood. The person is going to deliver the product. They call same day. Can somebody pick it up? Is it part of me purchasing the product that you deliver it? Like, is it their delivery fee? And that's like all kind of, that's all inclusive. And if I would have known that I needed to pick it up, then I could have made arrangement with my staff or myself. We, but now we two or three hours away from the event and now I got to go out my way to pick up something. Okay. Third time, because I like the product. Tell my staff, hey, can you arrange this with this person? This is what we need. And this time, can you please let them Oh, we don't want to be dealing with last minute having to pick up some stuff. Girl, why why it happened again a second time? Same day. Well, can you pick it up instead? So now me and my staff are in a fluster trying to figure out how to pick up this stuff so that we can look professional on our end, right? This is something that we want to have at our event that puts a nice touch on things. So, okay, we pick it up. And I guess this is where now I got to make a decision. Like, do I even use your service anymore? And yeah. and that's where we, that's where it is now. It's like, because if you do that to me two times, you'll do it to me a third or fourth. Of, your business is not right. Right. And I can't even refer anybody to you now because you've done this to me twice. And if you do it to me, you're going to do it to anybody who I refer to you, and then I'm going to be looking like a fool. And so unfortunately, it's those type of things also that I've dealt with with integrity, that if I pay you a certain amount of money, we agree on a price, and the price is you produce the product and you deliver the product, well, Amazon would not be in business. If they just let people purchase the product, but don't deliver their product, okay? That's the thing. And and that's why I wanted to do this topic because it's so important to have integrity in your business. Just because it's the 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 right thing to do, you know? Yeah. But also yeah. because it shows how you operate and how you do in business. And if you do not have integrity, in your business, you are impacting the longevity of your business. The longevity, and I think also it's connected to, okay, so you we know that I, I operate with this kind of like three-part philosophy of mm -hmm. that there is good, better, or best, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay, yeah, this hotel is good, but this hotel is better, and girl, this one is the best hotel. This wine is good, but wine is better. This wine is the best wine. So I operate with good, better, best. And it's like, I, I want to give the best referrals. And if you want to charge top dollar for your product and our service, you need to be over in that best category. So I remember the first time that I utilized this person's product, the price was one thing and it was a lower price. Girl, by the second and the third time, do you know the price was like double. So you want to charge me double the price and you giving jacked up service. It, it's not even, well, the product is good. The delivery was not good, right? right? So it kind of bumps you down from being in that best or better category down to like, it's good. But if I'm going to pay top dollar, I want to pay top dollar for the best. Exactly. Right? exactly. So that impacts your revenue that if you are not able to give better or the best service, then you cannot be charging dollar, yeah. you know, and we all want to grow. We want to, you know, maximize 
our revenue streams. And we may have to take a look at our business and really question and say, am I offering a good service, a better service, or the best service? Mm -hmm. Is my product quality good, better, or best? And then maybe that'll help us as business owners to make some adjustments so that we can demand that top dollar. Hey, right. One of my core values is the relentless pursuit of excellence. Not professional yeah. perfection, but excellence. Yeah. Try for excellence in all that you do. You know, your your business products, your deliverables, your the way your brand is put out or your business is is put out there. A lot of times we're not bringing the value that we believe we are bringing. And sometimes you can tell if a person is doing it from a place of desperation by way of needing money and yeah. they're just, you know, operating in that way. I'm a firm believer that we should be of service to the people that we are called to serve. For without yeah. the people that we are called to serve, your business does not exist. Yeah. So have integrity in your business. Mm -hmm. And we should always be evaluating and, and getting feedback mm -hmm. on what we're, our services and our products as well. So if you are not receiving feedback or you don't have a system set up to receive feedback about your services and your products, I highly encourage you to do so. And it doesn't have to be this expansive, you know, survey that you're sending out, but Ask the people that are purchasing from you, hey, how, how, what, how would you rate this? How did yeah. we do? Is there anything that you think that we can do better or, or that we should add and really focus on those things? And look, y'all, don't take the negative feedback personal. Right. Because these are people that have invested their hard-earned dollars and we know in this climate, in this in this economy, that dollars are limited. Okay, so if it's, it's a competitive market. You it know, is. It's it competitive. Is. So if someone chooses to spend their hard earned dollar with you, give them what they are asking for. Give them the transformation that that you said that you could provide them, and not take feedback or negative feedback with you or criticism, whatever you, whatever you think it is, do not take that personal and stay at use that as an opportunity to learn, yeah. to grow because customer community, you know, those um, partnerships, that's so important for your business. Let's talk about when you are training because you train yeah. businesses and organizations all the time, how do you even let them know that integrity is something that they need to might need to focus on within mm -hmm. their business um, or organization? Are there any specific strategies you use? Yeah, I think that doing um, first, you know, before I just like jump in, if it's with another organization, not with my staff, then I like doing assessment, like using assessment tools. So that there can be some self-reflection and self-insight that that organization can say, here's what we do well, and here's what we may need to improve on. That's first and foremost. And I, I do strategic planning sessions with organization. And that is like, before I ever come in and say one word to anybody, let's get a temperature first. Do an assessment and see, what do you guys think? How do you guys think that you're doing? And then if there's a way to, like you said, maybe survey clientele or customers or something like that and get a temperature and understand, what do your customers think? you know, about the services that you offer or the product that you offer. And then let's try to do a comparison, you know, between here's what you say and here's what they say, right? Yeah. And then starting with the education to say, all right, what are some strategies, some ways that we can improve in this particular area, in that particular area? But also starting with a goal, 
Like, what is the overall goal first? What are you hoping to achieve? Because I don't want to be the person that comes in and say, here's what you guys need to do. I want to understand your organization desires, right? What do you guys want to achieve? Is it, you know, that you're wanting to earn more revenue or get more grants? What's impacting that? Is it something structural? Is it something, you know, with infrastructure that needs to be fixed? Is it content? You know, what is it? So those are some ways that I help organizations to think about, you know, ways that they can improve their organization as a whole. Oh, my goodness. This has been such a good conversation. I like to give the listeners. I believe that it is always important, you know, as I mentioned earlier, to be of service and to give back and to always give back. Give to and give back, I'll say. I want to talk about the future of integrity in entrepreneurship. Looking ahead. How do you see the the value, the role of integrity involving, evolving in the field of entrepreneurship and even community program development? I would say that we know that the recession, the pandemic, there's like different touch points and touch zones that drives people into entrepreneurship, where people are just making this shift in entrepreneurship, I think is continuing to grow, will continue to grow, and people will begin to make those shifts perhaps in leaving regular Monday through Friday, nine to five jobs and getting into entrepreneurship. I think that the benefit of being in a regular Monday through Friday, nine to five job is that it provides some structure. Yes, it does, because you know that check coming. Also, you know what you can and cannot do on that job, mm-hmm. right? Like you, you pretty much know the rules. They yeah. gonna give you an orientation. They gonna give you an employee hand. They gonna tell you the rules. The person who has been there the longest is gonna come by your desk and say, let me tell you something, how it really work around here. Right. They gonna drop a duck. I think that that's the benefit of being, you know, with an employer, with a company, with a corporation. We forget those, those teachings, those structures, those systems. Now, when we venture out and become entrepreneurs, we, we can't be lazy entrepreneurs. A lazy entrepreneur is going to be a broke entrepreneur. Just I was, saying. I, I was one lazy and broke entrepreneur. You know, not too long ago. I'm just saying, we still have to put in the work. We have to have systems and structure. Yeah. You have to still have discipline. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur now. Everybody wants to start a business now. But I think the key component that will help you to guarantee your success as an entrepreneur is not forgetting some of those systems that we learn in our corporate job, bring those things over. You know, you need an orientation. So when you start bringing on staff members, whether they contractors or employees, have an orientation. I'm not saying you need to have 50 page or a 100 page manual, right? Nobody's suggesting that, but you need to have something to orient people to your business. Think about why did your job have an orientation? So you can learn about the job and you can learn about the culture of the organization and the expectation. So those should be the same things that you utilize in your company. Mm-hmm. Rinse and repeat. So I you think for the, the mamas out there, right? The mothers. Yes. The mothers, the, mothers, the mamas, and the mothers with a V. We have a system. We have strategy. We have purpose. We have values within our family. And and there are certain things that keep our families going. Bring those into your business as well. I was talking to a young lady and she wanted to start services with me. And she was just like, I don't have any experience with being a business owner, but I really have this burning desire, this passion that is is within me to serve this group of people. And I said, you're a mom. 
Not one time. Yeah. Not two times. But three times. You're a mom. Who keeps your house going? Well, me. Who plans out the meals? Me. Who structures outings and vacations and appointments and things like that? She said, me. I said, okay. So utilize those skills and yep. develop that or incorporate those things as you begin to develop and build your brand. Absolutely. We we have it within us and that's why it's even bubbling up mm-hmm. and brewing in you to be an yep. entrepreneur and a business owner because you already have the foundation and the ingredients that yep. can make you a successful one. Yep. You just have to put in the structure, put in the system and follow those things. Look, one thing that I appreciate about you, sis, leading up to this, you was keeping me on point, honey. I was getting those reminders. OK, it was like a reminder. You have scheduled the podcast. OK, great. All right. Uh, reminder in a week, you got your interview on the podcast. Oh, uh, Bro, you have the interview for the podcast. Oh, guess what? In one hour. You one have. hour. We, we are doing so many things. We wear so many hats. We, we are of service to so many people. And I can, uh, and, and I want you for accepting this, uh, invitation to be a guest on the podcast. I wanted you to know that I appreciated you and I'm trying to take things off of your plate. We talked about this a while ago and had this scheduled. I might have forgot that I had to, re- you know, record this episode. So allow me to extend that same gift to you. Yeah. I think it's the small yeah. things and, and the small ways that we can take things off of each other's plate because yeah. I'm grateful. I'm honored that you you are even collaborating with me. And here, and look, you know, you know, I love you. Know. The thing. I said, okay, if she's sending out four reminders, let me check scheduling platform and see how many reminders are my people getting because maybe this is why I'm having some cancellations or missed appointments or people not showing up. So thank you. I appreciate you. I'm like, let me go check and see how many times my folks are getting reminders because maybe that's the missing piece, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe Mm -hmm. that is something that is going to help my business. You know, I've talked to you about this before that I truly want to inspire Black women, specifically Black women entrepreneurs. And so I'm glad that I inspire you to even the detail of reminders in your business. I have enjoyed talking to you today. It's always a good time when I can talk to you. For sure, for sure. And thank you for sharing pieces of you on the professional side that I didn't know about. And hopefully from this, I'm, I'm about to be on my keep le- keep lee-ish. Hopefully, <laughs> I pray that whoever needs your services, it reaches its target audience. I, I just messed that up, but y'all but you did. It. No, you didn't. You didn't mess it up. Um, but no, I pray that From this episode, whoever this reaches, I pray that they give you the opportunity to bless them with your services, your expertise, your knowledge, your support, because what you do is so invaluable and is necessary and needed. And I want you, what I want for you and your business is for it to grow beyond what you could have ever imagined it to be. So, yes, I love that. Thank you. (laughs) I accept that. I'm in full acceptance of that. Take it on in, sis. Before we wrap up, I wanted you to share with us what you're working on right now, any new projects or business ventures happening with Grant Me Success. We'll be starting our Small Business Grant Academy. It's going to go for four weeks. We are teaching um, uh, small business owners how to find grants, how to write grants, how to manage their grants when they receive it because we want them to continue to receive grants once they get that first grant. Um, We want them to be successful with it. So it's uh, a four-week program. We're going to run with that for for a while throughout the summer and teaching small businesses how to get access um, to grants. That's what we have. 
going on and then just, you know, continuing to service our clients, writing their grants, teaching them how to be prepared for them, just helping people get the shmoney that's out there. <laughs> Period. <laughs> because that's what we need. Yeah. How can the listeners find you and how can they work with you? So we are at www.grantmesuccess.com. That's the website. And then we're on Facebook, facebook.com backslash grant me success. We're on Instagram. Our Instagram handle is at grant me success. So yeah, that's how people can connect with us and find us. Our, our address and phone number, email, all that kind of stuff is on the website if people want to reach out to us. Yeah, we're pretty accessible. The first thing that I usually encourage people to do is let's just set up a one-on-one consultation. Let's talk. Let's chat about if your organization is a nonprofit, if it's a small business. I want to learn about your organization first before we just jump into grant writing. Let, let's kind of court each other a little bit. See if I'm the right grant writer for your organization, right? Am I the right fit? Is your business really in the position to be able to go after grants right now? Or is your nonprofit organization in the right position? What's the infrastructure like first? So we start out with consultation. Then we, I usually try to recommend that people do one of two things after the consultation. Either one, they're going to do some self-education DIY, right? Go through our courses and learn about grants on their own. And perhaps this is something that they have the time to do, the understanding. They have the willingness to want to learn how to write grants, kind of like a DIY. Then I can teach you through our courses of how to find grants and apply for grants. Or you hire us to, to do it for you if you feel like I don't have the time, the wherewithal, I don't even want to learn about it. I just want to get access to the grant funding, right? We can do that. So it's really up to people what they want to do after they uh, do a consultation with us. But hopefully, you know, even after just the the one-on-one consultation of spending 30 minutes to 45 minutes with us, they will come out of that knowing a lot more about grants than maybe just what they have heard their friend tell them or somebody told me they got a grant. Somebody told me it's a lot of money out there for grant. Somebody told me you could get a grant. I can get a grant. We could get a grant. Everybody got a grant. Everybody got a grant. So yeah, hopefully I can um, help them to understand what this big, giant, broad industry is, you know, about grants. Listen, the federal government last year gave out 1.2 trillion dollars in grants. Did you guys hear me? 1.2 trillion dollars. And that's just the federal government. I didn't see what the state gave out, what the county gave out, what the city gave out, what foundations gave out, what corporations gave out, what venture capitalists gave out. Oh, we're talking a multi-trillion dollar industry for sure. And the way that you get access to it is you got to put your head in the ring. Yeah. You, but you got to be ready. You have to be prepared and submit quality and competitive grant application. And then you will be successful and hopefully getting a grant. Right. Which is where Janice Wiggins and Grant Me Success comes in. <laughs> She's teaching y'all how to do quality grant applications. I love this so much information. I hope you all took notes during this episode. I hope that you are picking up these gems that my last sister, my ace, is dropping on y'all this episode. Well, y'all, that's it for this episode of the Mindset Your Business podcast. Listen, I hope... I really do hope that you are feeling inspired and I hope that you feel connected as well. Remember, you are doing amazing work every single day and talking to you gives life to this community. And I want y'all to talk back to me. So connect with me on the socials. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Lanisha. That's D-R-L-A-N-E-C-H-A. You can also reach me by email. So there's no reason why y'all shouldn't be talking to me, okay? My email address is mindsetyourbusiness at drlanisha.com. Wherever you are listening to this episode, make sure that you are subscribed. In fact, do it right now so that you can stay updated and alerted 
about new episodes when I drop them. Also, share this new episode with your community. Tell them all about what we got going on over here and tell them that the reasons why they need to be over here. And if you're not already, if you can already join my email community, I'm real confused on what you're waiting for. Okay? Don't wait no longer. The link will be in the show notes. So until next time, take care and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.